Today's edition of the podcast is brought to you by Coach Me Plus. Coach Me Plus is the leader in athlete management software and a product that I've been lucky enough to be using for a little over a year now. Only rivaled by the impeccable customer service that Kevin and his staff provides, Coach Me Plus's ability to constantly be amoeba-like in their ability to mold and, and matriculate what you're trying to get across and bring together is, is absolutely fantastic. Their constant pursuit of better ways and better methods and, and innovations and progress to their own product is absolutely fantastic. Go over to CoachMePlus.com, check out what they got, guys. It's, uh, it's something that I guarantee you won't be disappointed with. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, we have an absolutely awesome talk with Mark McLaughlin of the Performance Training Center. Mark is an absolutely fantastic practitioner and does a lot of work with people of all ages. And we are going to talk about the entire long-term athletic development model and how he does it, uh, things that he looks for when he's developing his athletes, as in benchmarks and how he progresses the training, and really kind of get into some of the nitty-gritty of what he does uh, with the athletes all the way from 13 to the NFL Really an awesome talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Mark, thanks for being on with us today, bud. Jay, thanks a lot for having me. Great to see you. Yeah, you too, man. So when we talk, Mark McLaughlin, we got to talk about developing kids, developing athletes, the the process. So how about we touch on that and and let that drive the conversation and and we'll run from there. Yeah, absolutely. So when I'm begin working with the athlete, you know, whether they're 12, 13, 15, 20, the first thing we need to do is do some type of assessment, you know, for them. So whether it be, you know, on the physiological side with say Omega wave, um, and then a lengthy questionnaire, you know, to find out a, what their sporting background is, b injury his history, you know, how long they've been training, what type of training are they doing now, what types of sports are they playing, playing. Also, you know, how do they function in school? Are they high achievers? So, you know, taking an in-depth look at, at all of that and then also doing the physical testing. So when they're younger, it's it's very general. So, you know, sprints, you know, with with the timing system from free lap. Uh, vertical jump, 10 second jump test, uh, med ball throws. So, you know, going through the whole gamut of it. So we get the baseline and, you know, you do it with your guys there at, at Richmond. I mean, we need a starting point and then we need to know, you know, kind of what their strengths and weaknesses are and then begin to the, to, you know, lay that foundation. But then also understanding that, with the younger athlete, there's the education process outside of the training. So, you know, educating them on sleep, educating them on, you know, managing themselves on the nutrition side. Um, so, you know, kind of building the whole wheel, so to speak, of what it takes to be an athlete. Um, because the majority of kids that I work with when they're younger, you know, I've had three athletes turn professional. So, you know, they need skills outside of all this that are going to, you know, take them, you know, through the rest of their life. And so that's what I really try to focus on at the beginning. And that kind of starts the process off from there. No, that's awesome. So let's jump back. A lot of people can get lost if we start talking Omega Wave. Yeah. So let's go right to the questionnaire for a minute. Yeah. And you brought up asking them questions about school. Let's get into that and talk about how that gets into training and where that drives you with, with how you handle the kids. Yeah. So, I mean, as we've seen in, in, you know, high school kids and middle school, you know, the day starts extremely early, you know, they could be up at, you know, six 30, five 30, you know, got to get ready, got to get on a bus or school starts early. So then you look at their day, you know, from eight to three. And, you know, if they're in high school and they're, you know, they're taking, you know, advanced classes, um, you know, 
college prep courses, things like that, which I never took, by the way. I never, <laughs> I never That's had any of, of those classes. <laughs> That's two of us, Bob. Um, so then you understand that uh, that the stress that's imposed on them during school can be quite heavy. And so then when they begin to train with me, say, after school, it's like, OK, they may have tested uh, on the Omega wave in the morning. But then we need to also, you know, kind of understand that, you know, they've been in eight hours of school. And even though they may have tested well at eight that battery, so to speak, you know, maybe down quite a bit. So taking into account that, and then, you know, also understanding that the days that I don't see them, because I only see a lot of these kids, you know, twice a week, that they're doing things outside of school and just training with me to recover. So whether it be, you know, the tempo runs or walking or being active to help facilitate the recovery process. And then also understanding, and I, there's a, uh, Dr. John Sullivan, Mm -hmm. who, you know, the brain always wins. So really educating them on the basics that he talks about with sleep, hydration, nutrition to help them, um, you know, thrive instead of survive in these situations. So that's kind of the thought process that I, because if they're a pro athlete, then they have all day to train and recover. But when they're in school, it's like, okay, you know, maybe 45 minutes of weight training or tempo work today is sufficient for them. Because based on what they went through the past eight hours, that's going to get them the biggest benefit. So really, you may have a plan but understanding that even when they're 13 or 14, that that plan can change. And just because they're that age doesn't mean that you have to crush them every workout. Well, yeah. And it's, <clears throat> it's interesting because, you know, a lot of people talk about the plan and, you know, staying with the process and continuing to move forward and yada, yada, yada. But sometimes the only way to move forward is to take two steps back. Yeah. Yeah. And I also try to educate them, especially when I first meet them. It's like, listen, we're not trying to be heroes here. So your sport coach may uh, try to break your will and say you're weak or not mentally tough. And you you have to go through this work and you have to hurt and you have to have pain. But no, I want you to tell me when you're hurting, if you're tired. So we have this honest relationship that's really protecting them but also allowing them to um, thrive when the time is right. And so that's, you know, that's the other part of it. It's like, listen, live to train another day. And if you're hurt, it's hard to get better. Oh, no doubt. No doubt about it. Your, your best ability is your eligibility. Yeah, absolutely. So looking at that and understanding that all of the stress comes together and, and the questionnaire drives some of that mm-hmm. proactive setup that you have for the kids. Yep. Once you go through that, then how do you start designing these programs and where do you go from then? So for instance, I have, um, this past summer I had, uh, two kids that were, um, first years really training. They were 14 and 15 years old. So the training, you kind of need to educate them on the training process. So, you know, based on that first assessment, okay, how are we going to individualize the warm up for them? Um, So that's the first part that I focus on. And when you look at a lot of these younger athletes, part the movement is part of it, but then also beginning to develop that basic strength. So, You know, the warm up that I had for these two individuals was focused on, you know, low back work, you know, so bang and mornings. You know, we started with back extensions, starting with different, um, you know, hamstring work, whether it be with, you know, the glute ham raise. Um, So beginning to focus the warm up on their needs, both from a movement standpoint and then from just a basic strength, GPP, however you want to call it. 
And then we would move to speed development. And so how does that look for these guys? So they're young, they're relatively weak. Okay, so the starts are gonna be from a down position. We're gonna throw a med ball. Volume is gonna be you know, relatively low for that work. So maybe 100 to 160 meters total with full recovery. Then we may go, I begin to teach them you know, med ball work. So, you know, proper technique on that. Um, and then the strength work would focus more on body weight. So I want them to, I want to exhaust everything that I can on a body weight standpoint. And then once that happens, then we can begin to externally load them. And they're 14 or 15, so we have a lot of time to do that. So can they do push-ups right? You know, beginning to teach them how to do chin-ups. Um, so building, say, maybe an aerobic strength circuit with that work. Um, so you get, you know, the aerobic side, plus you get the strength side. And, you know, you teach them how to go through a circuit. Um, so that's so you have all this kind of going on. And plus you're teaching them about how to train rest periods. Because a lot of these kids come from these programs or have, trained at the Elks with their dad or something, and they're going from one to another. There's no rest. It's how heavy, heavy can I, you know, lift? So educating them also on why we're taking X amount of rest in between this to develop them. And then after two to four weeks, you retest, you know, did they get better? Did they not? And then based off of that, then you, you know, move on to the next sequence, however that is. And both these kids, for the most part, they ran 12 weeks of the most basic stuff. But then I use a lot of what Al Vermeil in his program, you know, the, the testing that he would do for football and basketball players and how much these guys improved just with doing the most basic stuff. It's like it was unbelievable because they're they're that age. They're in the development and it's you know relatively easy. Yeah, and I think that that carries all the way up through even you know the young college kids, man. Because oh yeah, there's there. I mean, you're 18 years old, man. You got you got more tea flying through you than than at any other point in your life. And the simple stuff just and all of a sudden you get going. Yeah, and when you really look, you know, there's the training, but then okay, man, how are these guys sleeping? You know, when you really kind of look back and see how important sleep is and these guys, you know, they want to take this protein or this creatine or whatever. And it's like, OK, well, based on how we're tracking your sleep and based on the subjective, subjective and objective data that we're getting, you can't even do this isn't being done right now. So let's improve on that and try to maximize that, um, you know cool cells and you know the basics are you know they're not that flashy um so that's what i try to instill in these kids is man let's just nail the basics right from the get-go and later on you know we can maybe get into that so then these kids go through that yep what do you use as your determining factor as to either a change it or b keep it going so, you know, part of it is learning about the athlete. So, so I'm, you know, extremely, you know, hands on there with the athlete talking to them. So, A, how are they moving? How is the progression? Are they continuing to have fun? You know, what's their body language telling me about what they like and don't like about the program? Um, so I had one kid who I was trying to teach, uh, you know, V ups to, and he just absolutely hated them. So, you know, so then you switch it out of, you know, you switch out of that. So I'm constantly, there's this, you know, give and take, um, to see, okay. So I had this one kid start with regular push ups. He got to where, you know, he could do 10 to 15 reps, 20 reps, extremely well. Okay, so then the next progression with him was, okay, now we're going to do them on handles. Okay, so it was just, you know, different. It wasn't anything fancy, but, and he, you know, he thought he was lifting, you know, barbell weights now. So, you know, he loved that. 
one kid, okay, we're going to put his feet up on a bench. You know, that's the progression there. Um, for some guys, say on the med ball throws, say we were doing like four explosive reps. Okay, maybe we're going to stick with the same exercise and go to six. Maybe we're going to go with eight. Um, so with the younger kids, it's more about how are they progressing? And if they continue to improve, do I need to change anything? Or do I need to change it to keep them entertained isn't the right word, but engaged. But the changing of it, they can still handle that change that I'm giving them. And it's not detrimental to the mechanics of, you know, learning a new skill. Um, with the older kids, it may be, okay, now we're going to track your speed, you know, on barbell weights or whatever. So there's a lot of different ways to kind of manage how we change it. But it seems as though you're making very minor changes or little tweaks to specific exercises as opposed to being like, we're going to go and put a whole different means in there, which is what many times you, you see, you know, across the board. Yeah. So my goal with the athletes is I want them, if they start with me at 13, I want them to be with me when they're 20 to 21, when they go away to college to, you know, work with someone like yourself. So, you know, I want them within six years. And so that's the mindset that I take is, man, this is long-term. And with long-term programs, the changes are very systematic. They're very simple. So when you get to year six, it's been very cohesive and there's not these huge changes that um, are drastic to the point where maybe injury happens. Um, and I also want to teach them that, man, Rome was not built in a day. And until you can master the basics of all this stuff, there's no reason to load you. Now, the flip side is that these kids may be participating in their high school program. Yeah. So then I need to teach them and look how they are squatting or benching or deadlifting. So are there things in the program now that I can do to keep them out of harm's way at school? So we do a lot of video with, with the phone, taping them, teaching them, going back, making changes. Um, Cause the, athletes and i think all i mean very visual so what can we do you know with the inexpensive phone to lock in you know the technique mm -hmm. no that's that's a great point to bring up because i think that i mean even above and beyond everything you know we work with the youth club the swim team right around the corner here too yeah. and, and i think above and beyond everything that we owe these kids when they go to another environment is the ability to walk in and perform, if not at a perfect level, at least a safe level, that they know what they're doing, even if it's something that they might not be doing with you at the present. Right. Moment. Right. And that's why, you know, I had I had this one kid that went uh, to a D1 college this year for football, and they teach the Olympic lifts. And again, I don't know the lifts. Uh, I don't know how to teach them, so I don't teach them. But then he came back, you know, for a couple weeks. Um, and so, you know, one day, you know, I just basically videotaped him doing those so then he could see and then he can remember what the cues were from his coach. Um, so, I mean, we're all in this together to give them the best opportunity to succeed. And sometimes, at least with the young high school kids, it may not be something that you're actually doing with them. Right. So then let's go back. So you said that you've got these kids two to three days a week. And mm -hmm. I know that they're doing stuff five, six. Yep. So let's talk about how you program those workouts away. And mm -hmm. where does readiness versus their preparedness fit in that role? Yeah. So with... The majority of the high school kids, I have them for two days. So, you know, it'd be like a Monday, Friday. So the, so the two hardest days. And then in between that, I'm giving them, I guess, you know, we can call it a conditioning day for lack of a better term. 
And with these younger kids, the conditioning work or the, the uh, you know, templates that I do with them, it could be some tempo work. It could be some hill sprints. It could be just walking. It could be, you know, jogging. It could be going to the gym and doing, you know, elliptical for, you know, 20 to 60 minutes. Um, so the readiness factor for those younger athletes, it's so easy that nothing's going to go wrong with them doing it. Meaning, you know, I'm not having them do gassers. We're not having them do anything like that. If they have availability to use a heart rate monitor, I'll give them ranges for that. Um, and it should be to enhance the sessions when they come to me on both, you know, a Monday and a Friday. Um, and then I'm constantly texting them and then, you know, getting, you know, subjective feedback from them on, okay, how did week one go with this? Okay, we increased distance on week two. What are subjective feelings here? If they're using a heart rate monitor, you know, was their heart rate less given, you know, the same task? Um, so there's a constant, you know, monitoring, you know, through those means as well. Now, again, the older athletes, um, you know, it may, it may be more, okay, you know, based on this day, based on your readiness, you know, through Omega Wave, okay, we're going to totally change things based on these reasons, whether it be from a workout standpoint or recovery standpoint. No, that's awesome. And then that makes me actually dive deeper into, okay, why are they not, you know, why do they look like this? And now with a college athlete, it's far different because they have, you know, different um, um, nuances to their social life that, you know, yeah. a 13 or a 14 year old, uh, you know, high school or middle school kid just does not have. Um, so, you know, the issues that I have are a little bit um, different than, say, what, you know, you're tasked with at times. Oh, yeah. But at the same time, it still comes down to the education component. Absolutely. And how do you, how do you give them the opportunity to make the behavioral change? Um, you know, that's one of the reasons why I'll monitor stuff, whether it be with sleep or blood work or Omega wave, it's, will this drive the behavioral change for the athlete? Cause you and I can give them all the literature, you know, we can type out stuff. I mean, you name it, but okay, man, what, is driving athlete A to make the change and not athlete B. Yeah. Then it goes back to, man, they're all individuals. So then this communication of how these kids think and learn, it really, that's the art of the coaching. Mm-hmm. 100%. So going back, we've mentioned multiple forms of aerobic work throughout this conversation. What are some other commonalities that you see at, across sports and age levels when you're looking at developing the athlete? Um, well, I, I think one, if they haven't come to me prior, just their lack of just basic preparedness because of how much these kids play these days and how much of the game they play. And they could be even 18 to 20 years old. Um, you know, I've seen some D1 football players that come in and it's like, Okay, man, you can't even do 10 push-ups. So, you know, but yet your skill allows you to earn a, you know, a $200,000 scholarship, but your limiting factor is going to be your physical preparedness. Um, so that would be, you know, number one. Um, you know, the second thing is just, you know, basic understanding of, the process itself, mm -hmm. that it's just not about going into the weight room and pumping iron, especially for team sport athletes, you know, okay, man, you're repeating this skill 50, 100, 200 times a game. So you need to have these other physiological factors in place that are going to allow you to display that skill at the highest level. And, and, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people, because they trained at the gym with their parents or their parents played D1 sports, 
that everyone's an expert. But, you know, you don't see me going into, you know, some doctor's office and, you know, performing surgery like, you know, Mr. You know, Jay, uh, I know you're a surgeon, but, you know, really, should you be making that incision there? I mean, but yet, you know, parents and athletes and coaches all come to us, you know, putting their thoughts out there. So so those are the, you know, the basic commonalities of it. Um, and I mean, you and I were talking beforehand. I mean, look at the injuries that happen in these sports that shouldn't be happening. Yeah. yeah and then I guess the question is, is that a preparedness issue or a fatigue issue or right. yes? <clears throat> yeah. And that's when it comes down to, okay. And especially at the higher levels where, where you guys are at, I mean, now there's GPS and there's all these other, you know, monitoring. And, and so, yeah. To say that, okay, because you didn't, because you weren't physically prepared, is that the only reason why these guys are getting hurt? And we know the answer is no, because um, a lot more goes into high performance than just you know the training aspect of it. Yeah, but I think that that the consistent point again that everybody keeps bringing to the table is you need to be able to educate the athlete into making the better decision. And that's why I really like where many of these things with monitoring are going, albeit some of them may be a little more fluff than actual positive content Mm -hmm. Um, in different situations. They may not actually tell you what they're telling you they're telling you. Um, Right. But I think that if you find the best stuff out there, it may cost money, but if you find the stuff that provides the best data, that allows you now to drive these decisions for the athlete by the athlete. Right. And that's part of the goal when I'm working with these kids when they're younger is to give them a basis of education when they go off to their college, if they're fortunate enough to play at the next level, that they have a knowledge base to be able to take care of themselves because some programs even the best, they just don't do it. And so giving these kids the tools to really take charge of their own health, which will then in turn, you know, improve their performance. Um, So, you know, wins and losses aren't the best predictor of how they take care of the student athlete. Oh, no, not at all. And it's, it's scary when you look at it. in in the mainstream, like going all over just with the kid as the center of the example where there could be some, as you said, you work on the whole wheel, but there may be spokes missing here and there. Yeah. So then when we look at that and we've now got people and we have the program set, what are the, the driving factors that lets Mark know that Johnny's going in the right way? What are your evaluations that you hold the highest stock in when it comes mm-hmm. to increasing sport performance? So from a physical standpoint, it kind of goes back to those basic test assessments that we did at the beginning. So whether it be vertical jump, you know, the 10 second jump test, you know, which is testing, you know, height and then, you know, flight, uh, ground contact time, um, you know, sprints, especially. You know, so whether it be, you know, 20 meter, you know, 40 yard sprints, all of it electric time, you know, so we really, you know, have a good basis for that. Um, On the physiological side, when they're younger, you know, the one thing I look at is resting heart rate. So, you know, we'll do a baseline on Omega Wave and then, okay, you know, throughout the program is the resting heart rate going down. Um, And then if we do any field tests on the conditioning side, is, you know, are those improving? Um, body weight could be one as well. Um, and then from a subjective standpoint, and this is probably one of the most important things is, is there still a joy in the training? Do they love it? Are they continually coming in, you know, highly motivated? Mm-hmm. Um, I had a kid, uh, Owen Marisic who played at Stanford and then played in the NFL and, for the Cleveland Browns. And I asked him one time his favorite thing about football was, and he said the off season. 
because he loved to train. And so, you know, that's the mindset that I want to, you know, so all those are in place. It's not, you know, objective is good, but then subjectively, are they still, uh, you know, supercharged to come in and do that? And um, so, you know, the, and also feedback from the parents of, are they doing stuff out of the ordinary? So now are they eating their vegetables? Are they going to bed sooner? So you know that they're invested for themselves. It's right. not somebody making them do it. So running back a little bit. Yeah. Resting heart rate is one that anybody can utilize. Yeah. So what does that do and how does that drive what you may do with your, your athletes? Um, well, so I had, Back when uh, I first heard Val give a presentation to us back in 07, we, he, he talked about setting elite parameters for these athletes. So, you know, what does the top level look like physiologically? Okay. And so, so we took that model and we kind of broke it down by sport and by the position. And then when I do the assessment on the athlete, even if they're 12 or 13, my goal is to move them closer to that elite level. And so, for instance, with American football for, you know, running backs and wide receivers, et cetera, you know, the, the, uh, the benchmark that we set was like 52 beats a minute on resting heart rate. Okay, so now through all the training that we're doing, is that one parameter? Are we moving that closer? And if we're not, what's kind of holding us back? And understanding that it's going to be, you know, long term and kind of how that is going to, you know, shift. But are they doing stuff outside of sport that's, you know, causing it to be high when I test them? You know, are they, am I having them tested in the morning on their own? Um, you know, is sleep can impact that greatly. Um, you know, nutrition, hydration. So again, it's, it's one point, but then it also allows me to dive deeper to educate them on the importance of that. Mm -hmm. And it's just another tool to keep them engaged in the process. Yeah, no, that's an awesome point. And I think that looking at things like that are where a lot of coaches worry about, well, I can't monitor this and that and the other thing. But that's such a simple, easy one. And making a Google Doc for kids is simple. And they got, yeah. they, they got these everywhere. So just and you're in. And it's we've had with teams that we couldn't use a bigger monitoring system with, like Omega Wave, we've had a lot of really good success with, with just tracking that. So that's a, oh, yeah. a really simple and awesome one. Um, and that's a great spot, Mark, for us to kind of move on here and, and talk about where can people find more. You've got programs that you put online. They could help oh, yeah. people wrap their heads around this. So let's let's give them that too so that at least they know where they can find out more information about what we've been talking about. Yeah, so my website is uh, resultsperiod1.com. Um, and then I'm on Twitter at results underscore period. Um, and then I am on Facebook just under my own name. Um, and, you know, I've tried to be over the years just be as transparent as I possibly can on – you know, putting stuff out there, you know, both, you know, both the good, the bad and the ugly on kind of, you know, what I do. Um, so, I mean, those are the ways that people can, can get in touch with me. Yeah. That website will be linked underneath here. There's a ton of awesome information and like legit programs. Like this is what I was doing with this kid yeah. who played baseball um, at this point of the year. And like there was yeah. one for a basketball player in season. There's a bunch of awesome stuff on there that people, if you haven't been taking advantage of it, you need to click the link below here right now and start scrolling through there because there's a there's like what like twelve pages worth of stuff. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And they can just send me a you know a million dollars you know via the PayPal <laughs> for all that. You and I'll split it. You can take fifty one percent. I'll take forty nine. Yeah, and then we're out. <laughs> we're out. <laughs> right, yeah. See you awesome. later. Yeah, we'll go start our. Our own Tim Ferriss show, right? Yeah, no doubt, right? That'd be great. <laughs> then we could talk, instead of talking for 33 minutes, we could talk for three hours and 33 minutes, right, you know? Right, right. But no, Mark, this is awesome, man. And thank you so much for being so open and transparent with everything you're doing, especially in this conversation. Uh, I can't thank you enough for being on, man. Thank you so much. 
Thanks again, Jay. Love yeah. being here. Appreciate it, bud. We'll be in touch okay. real soon. Okay. All right. And a huge thanks to the Performance Training Center's Mark McLaughlin for taking some time to talk with us today. Guys, absolutely killer stuff. Understanding the process and sharing everything so open and honestly. Can't thank it, Mark enough for taking the time to spend with us today and, and really be open and share. Guys, just like all the rest of the things that we put out, if you enjoy it, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice. You know, Mark was kind enough to, to really get to the nitty-gritty of what he does, so feel free to share it around. Check out his website, guys. Follow him on Twitter. Tons of awesome information. Always throwing things out there. And guys, like we're talking like legitimate programs that he's done with people in the past right there at, uh, at results period. So guys, check it out. And please, tweet it, Facebook, whatever you may. Send it on out there. We do uh, we do really appreciate it, guys. And we appreciate everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We'll be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.